That was not me. <laughs> Today's reading is from Acts 2, 1 through 21. When Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the regions of Libya, bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness and the moon will be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. If we've learned anything today, it's that Pentecost happens. <laughs> and whether the Spirit comes in tongues of flame or in radio interference from a nearby wireless microphone or however that may be, Pentecost happens, the Spirit comes, worship is disrupted, and if we've been reading and listening to our scriptures, we ought not be too surprised. <laughs> So for those of you who are guests today or are not one of our regulars, this isn't exactly how it always happens. <laughs> and yet on Pentecost, maybe this is exactly how it's supposed to happen. Amen. And for those of you who are our regulars, you've perhaps figured out in the time that we've spent together that when it comes to our scripture stories, as far as the preaching goes, that I'm a little less interested in the miracles and I'm a little more interested in how people find themselves inspired in the wake of such miracles. After this morning, maybe that's a mistake, but 
I don't want to downplay these events and scriptures that we have heard shared with us today. I mean, after what we can only describe as a relatively quiet and otherwise ordinary Resurrection Sunday 50 days previous on Easter morning, the happenings on Pentecost, which we heard there, are truly a big deal. Twelve disciples, tongues of flame alighting on their heads, preaching so that all who were present could hear the good news proclaimed in their own languages. That, that's a Ridley Scott level revelation when compared to the subdued, low-budget indie film approach that Jesus took in crafting his resurrection. Maybe I should double check and remind people who Ridley Scott is. <laughs> Whereas the risen Christ, he was only seen by a few, this spectacle of the Spirit was witnessed by some 3,000 people, and those were just the ones who heard the message of salvation and chose to become a part of this new Jesus community. The implication being that this was a show likely experienced by many, many more. And yes, if I didn't make it clear, I'm implying that the Holy Spirit is something of a show-off. Compared to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is having a fun time. Yeah. Show-offs. Now that actually should bring this story back to me, probably. This week, I found myself working on some things that are only tangentially related to my job description at best. Namely, I was rearranging my office and putting together my standing desk, which has sat in disarray in the corner of the room now for longer than I care to admit. And the thing you have to understand about this desk is that it's a project, a design I borrowed off a website that shares IKEA hacks, or designs for misusing IKEA furniture for your own nefarious purposes, <laughs> or at the very least, using it differently. So my standing desk is actually two different sets of IKEA bookcases held together with some extra screws and metal brackets. And honestly, it's a very functional standing desk until it's time to move it. Now those of you who have ever worked with these things know that in most instances saying that IKEA furniture is made out of wood is about as accurate as saying that white bread is made out of wheat. <laughs> Technically it's true but you do not want to know what they did to the original products to get it into that form. <laughs> I grew up on a farm folks. Wheat ain't white. So getting back to my point, in order to keep this stuff lighter weight and easier to move, construct, etc., a lot of IKEA furniture is made out of a particle board mix held together by some strange sorcery involving pressurization and wood glue. And normally that wouldn't matter unless you're drilling extra holes into your IKEA furniture in order to add extra screws to your IKEA furniture in order to make it do something not in the design of IKEA furniture. But even then, it's not a problem until you move it. Because once you take those extra screws back out, there is no amount of turning or twisting or cussing or praying that is ever going to get them to stay in those holes again. <laughs> the particle board mix, it just strips right out the moment you remove the screws. However, there is fortunately another hack to solve that problem. Matchsticks. If you cut off the ends so you no longer have the flammable part of the match, you can then gently hammer the remaining matchsticks into those stripped out screw holes and voila! Instant grip for stripped out screws. Don't believe me? Come see it. It works. <laughs> so when I had a surprise visit this week from Annie and Sandy, they arrived to find me haphazardly positioned underneath my so-called desk power screwdriver in one hand and a spare screw held between my teeth, not too far from a pile of match heads that Yuki had kindly separated from the sticks so I could go about the work of screwing my hacked together desk back into one piece. Now, Yuki will almost always protest that she has nothing to do with my crazier ideas. And she's usually right. But in this case, and she's not here to defend herself, so I will do it for her. I did ask her to do that. Anyway, 
Sandy happened to glance at the pile of match heads, and being far more creative of, of creative mind than myself, she wondered if I was working on some kind of visual demonstration that would involve flames for use during worship today. So I'd like to go on record now for the sake of our trustees and our insurance carrier and point out that in spite of the fact that I actually was kind of tempted by Sandy's idea, I am not creating an open flame in the worship space and have no plans to do so next year either. Well, we'll see. Next year's a long time away. So the point that I've taken a long time to get to here is, is that for my purposes this week, the heads of the match, they really didn't matter. In fact, they were basically throwaway by the time I got done with them. What mattered to me was the sticks that remained because they would be doing the hard work of making my various pieces of furniture not designed to be a desk once more begin to look and work and feel like a desk. The flames that I never actually created with these now disposed of match heads, they ultimately don't matter anywhere near as much as the sticks which are currently holding my hackneyed desk together. And this is where I want to get back to that Pentecost story. Because at the end of the day, I think we need to ask ourselves, are we more interested in the what or the why? I mean, the what is pretty incredible. And I don't want to downplay just how awe-inspiring this and any of the other miracle stories we read in our Bibles can truly be. But I'm kind of afraid of days like Pentecost Sunday and, frankly, any Sunday where we find ourselves confronted with the miracle stories in our Bibles because they always hold out that temptation to us to focus on the what rather than the why. Pentecost? It's an incredible what. Disciples speaking in tongues or entire crowds hearing in tongues, whichever way it may have worked. Flames dancing above our heads. A brand new community spontaneously forming out of what should have just been another of those incoherent days of various people from various places and speaking various languages wandering around an otherwise unremarkable and noisy marketplace. And while I'm playing around with those five W's type of questions, let's not forget about the who either. Let's just ignore for a second the all too convenient temptation to put this all on the Holy Spirit, giving us the excuse to sit around and wait for the Spirit to grasp us up as if we were mere puppets waiting for God to yank on our marionette strings, and focus instead for a second on the big human heroes in this story, Peter and the rest of the disciples. After all, they were the ones with the flames dancing above their heads, and they were the ones who were preaching good news in the miraculous manner that allowed all present to hear it. And especially Peter. His little sermon at the end there, at the conclusion, which admittedly is just a recitation of the final few verses of the second chapter of the book of Joel, his sermon seems to make him the named hero today, the great leader who is at least in part responsible for bringing about this great moment. If we are to look at this story and see it as a miracle by the chosen few, then it might become hard to find our place in that story. Yes, in our arrogance, we preachers might look to Peter as our analog in the story. But my job isn't to tell you how great I am. <laughs> as if you all needed to be told. No, my job is to remind us how great God calls us to be. And to point out, and to point that out by reminding us that in truth, the people we should be relating to in this story are the random John and Jane Doe visitors to the city center on what should have otherwise been just another average Sunday morning. As church, we're not sitting here within our walls because we're the ones who are filled to overflowing with the Spirit. If we were, we wouldn't be sitting here within our walls. We'd be out in the streets proclaiming the good news before our Sunday schools had even started this morning, being accused of being drunkards because we were saying wild things in wild languages. No, friends, if we were looking for an instant ego gratification in this story, I hate to break it to you because we're inside these walls as the un- and under-inspired today. We're waiting for Peter and the disciples to show up and to proclaim the gospel for us to hear. 
And that includes me too. Preaching to the congregation does not equate to preaching before the entire city. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I really am. I'm okay with that. Because we're not called to arrogantly assume that we are the next Pentecost performers. We are called instead to continuously be a Pentecost people, just like those who found themselves swept up in that great move of the Spirit that led to the founding of what we celebrate today as the first church. And we're called to be a Pentecost people, not limited to the confines of these 21 verses in one chapter, in one book, found in one testament of our Bible, but to be the people who do the heavy lifting alongside the fires of Pentecost, or excuse me, the heavy lifting long after the fires of Pentecost have ultimately burned themselves out. That excitement and that energy, we all know it doesn't last. Like that pile of match heads that was sitting there in my office, yeah, we could have had a real light show going for about a minute as they all went up in a nice big whoosh of flames. But then what? Long after those heads had burned down through all of their potential, the matchsticks that remain behind will continue to be the metaphorical glue that holds my hacked-together desk in one piece. And they'll hold it there again until I dismantle it once more someday. Pentecost people, we have to be what remains when the fires have burned out. The people who are there, unnamed, but continuing to do the work of the gospel in ways both great and small, we have to be the ones that will build up a community of believers who share things in common, who provide meals and shelter and take care of one another, like what we read at the end of Acts chapter 2, or once again later in Acts chapters 4 and 5. And we have to do the work of selecting leaders from amongst us to serve in various capacities, some with gifts for service, to be setting the tables and attending to our property, while others with the gifts for speaking will be doing the praying and the preaching, and others with the gifts for compassion, they'll be doing the care ministry, such as what we see happening in Acts chapter 6. And we'll have to weather the storms. There will be times that are hard, and we'll feel as scattered as the early Jerusalem church must have felt in the wake of the stoning of Stephen and the arrival of Saul, our not-quite-yet-friend Paul, as witnessed in chapter 8. And we'll have to prepare to carry our message out the doors and into the world, just like the early church as it followed Peter and Paul and Philip and Barnabas and Timothy and Silas and Apollos in the ensuing chapters of the book of Acts, to say nothing of the women who did not get mentioned, but whom Paul makes a point of honoring within his own letters. Apphia and Phoebe and Priscilla and Junia and Mary and Tryphena and Tryphosa and Persis and Julia and Nympha and Chloe and Euodia and Syntyche and many, many others who surely still remain unknown to us today. Today, we have done some of these surface level things that we do to commemorate the big day of Pentecost. I look out and I see a sea of red. Y'all look good, by the way. And you look up and you can see the red and the banners and the pyramids for yourself. And we even changed up the order of the worship service beginning today and, ironically enough, now, as you will see as we move on from the sermon directly to the communion table. And yes, I did it today because it's Pentecost Sunday, the birth of the church, the rebirth of the church. But if we're being honest, none of this is what Pentecost is really all about. Heck, even Pentecost Sunday isn't what Pentecost is all about. It's us, the listeners, who are struggling to hear the gospel proclaimed in a language that speaks to us, and in turn, who will willingly respond by stepping up to be a community, to be loved, to be compassion, to be welcome together. And it won't be a one-day affair like it's recorded in the story, but just another step in a lifelong calling to live and be faithful as individuals and as church. So getting back to where I started at the beginning of this message, no, I don't really care that much about the miracle that kicked off that first Pentecost and inspired that first church. I'm far more interested in the miracles, large and small, 
that that first church went on to perform and the great acts of faith that they went on to show. And I'm far more interested in the miracles, both large and small, and the acts of faith, both great and minute, that we may yet be called to be a part of, and the ways in which the Holy Spirit might yet move through and around us, equipping and inspiring us not just to proclaim God's good news, but to live it beyond our walls and out to the ends of the earth. Now that, that will be a miracle worth celebrating. So let's dream dreams and prophesy together as Joel called us to do. Let's call on the name of the Lord to be saved and to save others. And let's get to the work of building up the church that God wants us to be. For we are called to be a Pentecost people. Amen? Amen. Amen.